Hey, what's going on, everybody? Happy Thanksgiving to each and every one of you. I hope you're having a beautiful time with your families right now. I know that we are socially distancing, and I hope that you are kind of adhering to those things that are going on in your community. And I've heard some really interesting things of how people are celebrating their Thanksgivings today. I see we have one person on. I'm sure that's Lynn here. <laughs> it's got to be. Um, I'm sure that you are all celebrating in your own special way with your families. I'm about to get our grub on as well, but I made a promise that I wanted to make sure that on every Thursday at 312 was going to be coming on, at least in the year 2020. So I wanted to honor that commitment. So I won't be on very long. I do have some things I want to share with you. And so if you're taking a break, maybe it's a siesta time. Maybe you already had your dinner. I just want to, to share a few things with you. Now, if both of you that don't know me, my name is John Register, and I am on a world. Hey, Lynn, I see you. Thank you, Lynn, for, for being on. I, I knew that was you. <laughs> I don't know that. Could you tell me? Um, so for those that don't know me, my name is John Register, and I am a professional communicator, speaker, some people call it. Uh, but most folks know I kind of get into the Kool-Aid and stir it up a little bit and try to have these outcomes that are really dynamic not just for me but from everybody else so we call this show hurdlers of adversity inspirers and maximizers of pivotal moments and um, my story is pretty easy i was the richest to rags the richest story and wound up having a uh, as a world-class athlete had a hurdling accident which resulted in the amputation of my left leg i then went on to win a silver medal in the, in the, in the long jump in sydney australia so that's a quick down and dirty version of the storyline you can look on youtube and i have some videos out there that you can actually see the actual in, in, um, the actual uh, injury. So, Lynn, yes, I know you're sharing with your husband and your mom. That's awesome. Thank you for uh, jumping on for these few minutes that I ha have here. And I'm not anticipating a lot of people on today because I really want them to be with families. Like I said, it's just really about uh, being authentic to myself and just making sure that I go live and that we're going to have our dinner at 4 o'clock. So I'm glad they kind of pushed things back. But if you hear some chairs upstairs bumping and bumping and stumping, uh, that's because they're moving stuff around for uh, just a few, very few people that are going to be coming over. Um, so I wanted to start off by saying uh, I'm what I'm thankful for, right? So there are a lot of things that we oftentimes in our mindset we're not thankful for. And, and, and sometimes you can go that way just because of COVID that, that's hit so hard and people have lost loved ones. And it hit our home really uh, pretty impactfully, right? Um, my daughter, myself, we came down with COVID. Uh, my wife came down with it too, so we're all in the same home. Alice, uh, Ashley, myself, my daughter, myself, we were pretty mild uh, for the most part. You know, I had an elevated heart rate for a little bit. I uh, had just a slightly trouble breathing, go up and down steps. Heart rate wouldn't come down after a bicycle ride. So that was, you know, that was like, oh, okay, let's, let me get this down. And when Ashley came back with her positive test result because she was feeling the weather and Alice and I were starting to feel the weather, we decided just want to take a COVID test at the, at the doctor. So we did. We both came back positive. So we started our incubation period, you know, getting away from people. And we were, uh, we were always wearing masks, always washing our hands. But uh, just kind of want to make sure we isolated even more than what we were doing. And even around the house, we're kind of on separate levels. And we, we kind of went to a, a, another extreme. But on Wednesday, you know, about four days after we were um, in the quarantine process, uh, Alice really started getting sick. And uh, she started going down. And so we we're starting to get these teas and we we're trying to get these herbs and things and kind of open the, the nostrils up and some things that we bought in Dubai and try to open that up and just wasn't working. And by Saturday, I mean, she literally was struggling to breathe. And it was the, one of the most scariest things that I have been through. I mean, I. I mean, I've been to the war and those, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about when you are feeling helpless to care for a loved one who is just, you see them struggling, you see them struggling to breathe. Uh, so we got to the hospital, she got cared for, uh, and we got her back on Wednesday uh, evening and she's really recovering. So here's kind of, if you want to know the, the facts of the register household case, Alice and I would go do our walks in the morning time, probably about two miles to sometimes four miles in the morning before I would start the work day and she would make she's a flight attendant with an airline. Um, and you know, we we're just doing our walks and talks and stuff. Today or yesterday when we went out for a walk, she couldn't even make it around for a half a mile. So it's still with her uh, before she had to sit down, rest and just kind of catch her breath. So you see that this thing can really take you out. And for those that think, you know, it's a hoax or it's, you know, it's not really real, uh, I pray that you don't get it. 
um, or at least to the degree that if you do get it, you probably had it and kind of just skate, skating on with it because it does impact people just like the flu does very differently. But this, when you do get it and it gets into the lungs, um, it shuts off your air. You can't, you can't breathe. Um, it, it's just, and to struggle, the gasp, when you see people in the ICU just struggling to breathe, there is no, there is no vaccine for it right now, right? We're, they're working on one, but there is nothing. So you just suffer through it. And that's why we see all these deaths that have happened. So we can look at the negative side of what we have been going through with COVID. And then I won't get into all the, the Black Lives Matter and George Floyd and all that stuff, uh, because that just takes us a, another thing to un, kind of unpack. But I do want to say that um, ye- yesterday I was on Twitter, just kind of reading some tweets and things as I was watching television. And I saw our mayor, John Southers, in Colorado Springs. He had a nice tweet out. It was all masked up in his garb going over to our hospital, uh, Memorial Hospital here in Colorado Springs, just to kind of check on people and see for himself what was going on in these amazing workers and these these hospital care staffs that are uh, working with these these patients. So he kind of tweeted out a couple things from the mayor's office on, hey, this is real. I can't believe what I'm seeing here and and the ICUs and people struggling. And there are a couple things that I noticed. One is that he says, you know, you know, make sure that you check. You can come and check in on your loved ones. And I said, no, time out. You can't check on your loved ones if they're in a COVID ward. Right. That's first of all, because they won't let you in there. Um, So the people that are in there are in there by themselves uh, with the, the great staff that's there. But they're in there by themselves. Alice was in there by herself. I could not go in and out and walk and give her flowers or give her anything or go sit with her or just be in the room with her. No, I was outside and could not go in. And so if you think about it, the people that even get it worse and have to even that have to go on a ventilator, they're there by themselves. So we you don't get a chance. Like we're we're in these family environments right now trying to either zoom it in or how we're gonna do it, but you don't get that opportunity. And that's that is one struggle. I think the, the second thing is, you know, I, I got a, a note from somebody. I went to school in Arkansas, University of Arkansas, and somebody said um, on the wards that are there, he kind of was doing a tongue in cheek and say, yeah, our wards is just just are kind of empty right now. We don't see anybody here. Kind of wink, wink. And, um, you know, kind of making the play to that. This is, thing is really not as bad as it sounds. So, A, that triggered me <laughs> because when I saw my wife not being able to breathe, I don't care where you are. <laughs> That's what's going on in my household. I know that's exactly what's happening to her. And so I was uh, really in that in that space in the moment. So I kind of went in on them uh, a little bit, <laughs> a little bit. Uh, and just saying, you know, just because you're in a different part of the country, it might not be affecting you the same way it's affecting somebody else. I said, my wife is sick in Colorado Springs, not Fayetteville, Arkansas. And so I never heard from that person again. <laughs> but I usually try to stay pretty tame on social like that. Uh, but not not that not on that day. So I had to I kind of had to push that forward. Um, this, this, the third thing is um, a, around how we are, you know, kind of handling and, and two two things of what we're we're actually thankful for with some water <clears throat> and what we choose to be thankful for. I think it's all about our mindset. And so there are two things we really want to share with everybody today on on mindset and and one is um around echolocation so what 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 is that (laughs) so echolocation there i I think about it in three different ways one is like dolphins dolphins use echolocation to see where they are in the water right they can see some fish or they see their whatever food that they're looking for they know where a reef is and they use echolocation it's like sonar goes out it bounces back to them they hear it and they can move and swim to the fish uh, and get their get their meals. You know, the beluga whales use it as well. Bats use it. That's number two. Bats use it as as well. So other other mammals so on the on the on the land, uh, bats use. You know, they they don't see. They're blind, so they use echolocation to, to figure out where they are. That's why they're flying all over the place. You know, with like those clicking sounds. And then um, echolocation also is used with people who are blind. And I saw several people that I know who are, you know, in my I'm, I'm in the space of disability, that use echolocation to find out where they are in kind of a space environment. So they use clicking sounds, and the echoes, the the, the sound goes forward, and it bounces and comes back to them, and they know how big a room is, how small a room is, 
by the way the shoes will bounce off the walls or if there's an opening or if there are pillars that are in the way. They've been e even able to use them. Hey, Tracy, how you doing? Great to see you. Arkansas, in the house. I was just talking about y'all. <laughs> Not about you, but about what was going on uh, about some somebody on Twitter that that's it, that was talking about COVID. You have to go back and look at it. Look at it. Um, so thank you, Tracy. After you said hi. I'm going to put you out there, shout you out. Boom. There you go, Tracy. Thank you. I hope that you are talking to my daughter. I've been talking to her um, about going to the University of Arkansas So for, for law school. So we'll see. Um, so getting back to the echolocation. So in the echolocation, of course, in mammals, and bats, um, but blind people use echolocation as well. So they heighten their senses when they're in a room and they, the, the clicks of their shoes will tell them how large the space is, how small the space is, if there's anything in their way, obstacles. And it's really amazing to watch. And you, you think a person can actually see because of the way they've heightened their sense of the echolocation to tell them where they are in time and space. So, you know, I always try to go one step further. Uh, and I, I began to to use this. Yeah, thank you. I, yeah, keep on trying. Keep on trying, sister. Uh, get, it, get it there. Uh, save, save me some money. <laughs> um, the, uh, so she did just take the LSATs. So I don't know what her score is, but I think she was, she was pretty happy after the, test, after the testing. She hasn't come back. Scores haven't come back yet. Uh, so anyway, on the echolocation, I believe that we also see the, this, this happen in life that we get something that we have sent out. So maybe that's a ripple, you know, we throw a, pond, a, a stone in the pond and the ripples go out. But when those ripples hit against something, the echo comes back to us. And I think that is um, something that is extremely powerful that we don't listen to. We don't, we don't know what it is and we don't know how to identify it. And I think they're powerful because they can course correct us and make sure we're on the right path. For, for example, I, I, when I went to the Gulf War, uh, I was over there and I took a book with me. It's called, it was called uh, Hearing God by Peter Lord. So it was a really interesting read. And the first part of the book, I don't know if it was the prologue or whether it was the first chapter, he was talking about entomologists, this entomologist that could... Uh, identify crickets, like 300 crickets by just the sound they made, by, by the different types of chirps that they would make. I was like, who wants to do that anyway? But this guy did it. So as I was over there in uh, Saudi Arabia, I decided to try to put this to the test. Could I actually use echolocation or identify things by the sound that they made? And maybe that could save my life. <laughs> so I had a heightened sense. I had a purpose for doing this, right? And so I, I, I started listening to helicopters and trying to identify American-made helicopters that were coming in our direction when they took off, when they came back. So there were there were four that I, I was able to get to. I could identify the Apache because the Apache helicopter has four blades and it made a different sound than the OH-58A, uh, which is a two-blade helicopter. And then it, which made a hugely different sound than the UH-1H, um, which is a Huey. Often it was back in uh, Vietnam War era. That's we, we probably you see those in the movie all the time. Which the, the pilots always say that the Huey does not fly; it just beats the air into submission. <laughs> so it's like a wop 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 sound. Um, and then the Cobra, which was another kind of it's a Bell aircraft as well, um, and which made a different kind of a whiny machine sound. So I could identify all four of those aircraft and a couple others before I even saw them. You know, I could hear them coming and I knew what it was. And I said, well, shoot, if that's the case, then what am I missing in just time and space uh, of what might be coming back to me? And echolocation, I think, is are these inspirational waves that we put out that begin to come back to us and we can tune our ear to hear those things. So that's what I'm thankful about. I'm not going to go into into depth in that. I just don't, we just don't have the time to, for me to kind of do that. I do that in my presentations, kind of expand that out and i got some stories around it and then we do some practice models of how you can actually heighten your sense to hear now it works both ways right the things that we put out can be positive and the things we put out can be negative as well and so if it comes back and there's a course correction and we begin to see in our life like for example a really simple example 
if I do a speech, the speech goes out, somebody shares the speech with someone else or a story from that speech with someone else and with somebody else, and then it comes back to me from this fourth person, I know that what I said was resonating with the audience in such a way that they wanted to share the information, and it comes back to me. I, don't nev I never know what's going to come back, but it comes back. Now, not from the original source that I sent it to, but from other external sources it begins to come back. And that says, okay, what you said is, is correct, it's, or at least it's, it's impacting somebody in such a way that it begins to help them in their life enough so that they want to share it with somebody else. And that's a, that's a correction. But I've also put some stuff out there that was the same thing, and it came back to me negatively, right? It came back to me in a way that was, I didn't want that out there. And so what I was saying, I had to adjust my, either the tenor in which I said it, uh, the, 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 the negative impact that it may have landed, how it may have landed on somebody. Uh, and so I had to own that and then try to switch it and change it and put out the positive. So we'll get them back in either case, either, either way. So what do you think about that? Put that in the chat. I'd love to, to kind of understand and know what you think about kind of this, this whole flow of echolocation I'm putting about, uh, I'm, I'm throwing here. And, and what do you think? Uh, I'm putting that out there. I've, I've, I've kind of been working on that a little bit longer now. And, and it's, been, it's been going pretty well because there are, are two really powerful stories I share with individuals that just blew my mind with that story. I'm not, like I said, I'm not going to share them here. But um, I'll probably put them uh, in the book that I'm going to be writing between December the 7th and the 13th. Okay, so that's one, is, is echolocation. And that is something I'm very thankful for, that I'm now able to hear those things that come back. Very small things and very, or very maybe very large things as well. Uh, so, yep, so Tracy and Lynn, I think you're probably only too long. <laughs> you probably finished your dinners now. Uh, but just uh, share that with me, what you think about that. All right. Um, okay, let's go to the second thing. The second thing has to deal uh, a little bit closer to home and what I've been working on. There's an amazing lady, um, uh, an, absolutely, a newfound appreciation for echolocation. Yeah, I think that we can use it in our lives. And I think it's, it's, uh, it's something that we get a chance to, uh, not that we're really looking for it, Although I do, I, I, I now am, I'm, I'm, I'm listening for those echoes that are coming back. Uh, but just to pay, just to be astute when they do come back, and just not let them pass. That this is something that is that we need to uh, pay it, pay attention to. Uh, so the next thing is is kind of in this pathway that I sh I share a lot, which is the pathway from fear to freedom. Um, I'm going to try to put it up on the screen. I'm going to. See if I can stop sharing that screen. I'm going to open up the screen and share this with you. I want to see if it will if it'll work. Yep, I think so. So here's, um, oh, you know what? My gosh, that looks horrible. So I can't I can't share the uh, a slide because it's looking crazy. Uh, so all right, so no worries. We're not going to share that one. <laughs> um, I'm going to share another slide with you, but it's not going to be that. It's not going to be that one. And I'll just get rid, get rid of that get one ready to go. And I'm not going to add it to the stream yet because I don't want that one. For some reason, these these streams are just not working for for this today. So I'm not sure what's what's going on. Anyway, so I'm gonna so I have this this whole flow. It's from this this pathway from fear to freedom. I'm gonna share share it on on Thursday, kind of in a, in a next Thursday in a in a larger format. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna be speaking for the meetings professional industry on the first of December. I'm gonna share this concept that I've been sharing all this year to really help companies, organization, people overcome the the fears that they have around COVID or the Black Lives Matter or the, the political spectrum and election. And it really helps us work through a process that we have. It's my system, my process. It's not unlike somebody else's process. It's just the way I look at it and my, I interpret it. And I'll, I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but I just want to talk about this, this fear that often comes in. And so what I'm thankful for is being able to have a pathway for me and a pathway to share with others to how they can navigate through this uh, these these times. And one of the things I, I started working with, I started working, um, I call a, a woman, her name is Kat Coppett. Uh, she's brilliant. She's an improver. Uh, she is also uses applied improvisation for her business. And I had hired her a couple times to help the Olympic and Paralympic athletes begin to tell their journey stories. And as she was leading this, the discussions, I really, um, 
Hey, hey happy Thanksgiving to you, uh, Tracy, as well. And happy Thanksgiving. And, oh, that's all oh, you, oh, you all are talking to each other. That's great. Awesome. <laughs> um, so she, Kat came in and really did a great job of helping the Olympians and Paralympians tell their journey stories in different, different ways. And I was intrigued by how she did it. And so we've kept in contact for the, over the years. And I've always kind of just used her and called her when I needed something that was like, okay, this is a little bit above my pay grade. And I need to get something done that uh, I, I don't know how it's going to actually work. So the first thing that we collaborated on, um, I was asked by USA Bobsled to come in to, to facilitate a conversation because the team was really kind of out of sorts. Uh, we were heading into Sochi, Russia, and there were it was very contentious uh, team selection process, uh, which is always pretty contentious. But this time was, it was even more so. It was really bad. And so uh, the executive director at the time, Darren Steele, who was one of my athletes when I was working for the Army, he's an Army guy as well, um, he says, John, come here. I need you to, to fix this in 90 minutes. <laughs> I'm like, you need to do your magic. Spread your dust. <laughs> and, uh, pixie dust. And I was like, I don't know if I can. I don't know if I can get to this one, Darren, you know, uh, because I'm not, I won't go into the whole story, but Kat really gave me a, 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 a role play model that worked exceptionally well. And I could not, because I could not go in there and say, you can't do this. You can't do this. Because as soon as you start pointing fingers and saying that, it's never going to work. They're going to tune you out. You got 90 minutes where you're just trying to survive. Uh, all these A-type personalities, all these really high level, highly motivated athletes, and some of them are not going to make the Team USA. So, uh, so what I had to do was get them to admit first that they that some of these behaviors were going on, and then I could slam them. Um, and that's that's what happened. And it was because Cat gave me a scenario that I could work with. So again, I'm not going to go into the scenario. Uh, we can talk about that later in someplace someplace else. But it was it was it actually worked brilliantly. And we were able to get them in the right mindset for the team selection process. And actually, they won some some medals over in, in Sochi. So, uh, hey, AI, thank you so much. I appreciate that. And I appreciate you you, you enjoying this. <laughs> uh, I am too. And I'm getting ready to, in a few more minutes to go, go upstairs, get my turkey leg. And, and after I get the turkey and that, that sedentary thing hits me, I'm going to go on the couch and uh, on the couch and go to the couch and go to sleep. <laughs> um, so... Uh, so, so that was that's what was happening, right? So, in the spirit of freedom model, what begins to happen is we have these individual fears, and so what's that? So, my fear was when I lost my leg or had my leg amputated, that I I was not going to get my leg back because my 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 the way I was thinking about it was had I overcome the amputation of my left leg, I'd have my leg back. And I think that's what we often think about. We think we're going to get back a time period in our life after we've moved past it. Think about it from this, the COVID standpoint. How many of you think out there, your friends think out there, your family thinks out there that life is going back to normal? Normal's gone. Normal, normal's gone in March of 2020. But I, I argue with you this too, that normal was also gone in February of 2020 and in January of 2020 and December of 20. Of 2019 because we always elevate where there's always something changing and so because it was so grandiosous and so big and, and and we weren't we didn't think that we were prepared for it we began to panic we started going out and running out and buying toilet paper in fear and we, we started to, to try to just control what it was that we thought we were losing control of so now we also, so that's the fear. So, so when I lost my leg, when I had my leg amputated, <clears throat> I was thinking, okay, well, my wife, Alice, will she still stay with me? Will my son, John Jr., will he still see me and value me as his dad? Will, will my son, uh, will, my, will, will the Army still have me involved in, in, um, in going on to officer candidate school? I mean, that's not going to happen. So all these things, my Olympic dreams were gone. My career was gone. And these fears started coming up in me. It was also fears of others, other people believing for me what I could or could not do, which was based upon what uh, they believed, the others believed I could or could not do if, if, if they were in my situation. So it's these people trying to pull me back, hold me back into what into their box to make them feel comfortable <laughs> because they don't want to, they, they have a hard time calling me on the phone because they don't know what to say. 
and we do this all the time. We, we, I don't. If we have somebody that's in the hospital who's sick, some people just don't make the call because we don't know what to say. And I say make the action step. Pick up the phone, make the call. The words will come out. They'll flow, and the person will be very appreciative of just the effort that you made because everybody knows it's hard to make those calls. I still have a, a tough time making calls when people are in, in the hospital, but we got to just go through it. And that's the courageous part of that of that conversation. Hold on, I gotta get some more water on this. So the third thing then is culture. We have these cultural um, stigmas that begin to drive the way that we think about things. So for example, and I, I say this a lot of times in my presentations, I'm six years old, I'm watching a Walt Disney movie, I'm watching uh, Peter Pan, Peter Pan has the villain. Who's, who's the villain of Peter Pan? Put it in the chat. <laughs> Put it right down in the chat. Who's the villain of Peter Pan? Uh, so if you say Captain Hook, you're absolutely right. And so Captain Hook, he is an above the wrist amputee. He wears a hook. He got a claw. And he's the villain. He's dark. He's mysterious. And he's scary for a six-year-old kid who's watching this guy with a mustache. And he's arr and the pirate. And so I'm a little bit afraid of this guy. But wait a minute. Now I'm the amputee. Am I the one who's now dark and mysterious? And is that why children will point and say, hey, there goes Robot Man, there goes Iron Man. And mom and dad will say, no, it's impolite to steer. We need to get them down a different aisle. We need to take them away from the situation. How many times do we do this in society? Are we told that that is wrong? So therefore, I'm going to believe what society has said. And because I'm going to believe what society has said, that's going to dictate my behaviors of how I'm going to show up, even if I know that thing is wrong. And that's where the, you know, the, the courage comes in. Like I said, I'm not going to go through the whole chart. I just want to focus on this fear piece right here because I'm going to, it's going to do a little, not even a deep dive. I can't even do a deep dive on this because it's, it's just too meaty. So Kat is helping me draft a half day and a full day training session. I'm probably going to go out to six months because this, it, there's so much, it's so rich. And I, I don't want to go wide. I want to go deep into the material because I think it's, it, it releases people. People begin to understand it for themselves. I will say that there's a redefining moment that comes up. And that redefining moment is that we have to have the courage to amputate or or jump. So the question I have for you uh, right now that I wrote down and we're, we're looking at is, okay, so what then are you anticipating getting back that is now holding you back? What do you anticipate before the COVID or, or for, before you found out that the race relations were actually real in America? Um, what do you anticipate get, uh, not getting back that is now holding you back from a new normal mindset? What is it? We talk a lot about this in, in, the, in my presentations, right? Because that is a, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a question that gets into ish. The German word for I. It gets into me. I can't move it to somebody else because the I question is what am I anticipating getting back that's not coming back, that I think is coming back, that's holding me back from this new normal mindset. Like I said, I thought I was going to get a lifestyle with my leg back again and all that stuff is going to come, but it's really not. It's not there any longer. So I have to make this choice inside of that. And so the question, the second question to that then is. Once you've identified what that thing is and you know it's holding you back, do you have the courage to release it? Do you have the courage to let it go? Do you have the courage to amputate it to embrace your new normal mindset? Do you have the courage to do it? Here's what happens. Okay. Um, if we if we do, which is great, we, I, I call it the rebirth. We, we're, we're like, oh, my gosh, I, I found this new life, and I don't just – run off into the new life, I have to learn how to, to walk again. I, like I had to walk with my leg. I have to learn how to run again, jump again. All these things I have to learn all over, and it takes me six years to do that. But if I don't do it, if I know that the thing I'm looking at is the right thing to do, and I have to make the jump, and I don't have the courage to make the jump, what I must do then is then justify why I didn't have the courage to jump. I have to justify, maybe to myself, maybe to the others. But in any case, I have to justify why I was not courageous enough to make the jump. 
and we can put this to into any context that am I going to have the courage to have the conversation that is the difficult conversation? You know, we looked at um, in, in in February when we had uh, kind of thing was was it Breonna Taylor I think was murdered in, in February. We had uh, George Floyd murdered in, in March, and then I think it's Ahmaud Aubrey in April. I think I think I got the dates right. But the the the, the courage in the system is. Do we honor and value and say what is the right thing, or do we begin to spin it to justify why I can't say what actually happened? And that's we, we see it, we see it in the political system. You know, if <laughs> and I'll probably get in trouble with doing all this, but um, if I go back to when my son was playing soccer and you know, he's on a little traveling squad. And the score at the end of the game is four to one. We all pack up and go home. If it's four to one and they lost, they up there on the losing side, but he actually says he won. As a parent, I'm going to scold him and say, no, you had your opportunity, you had your chance as a parent. So if I know that's the right thing to do there, then what makes me say something different? I have to justify the reason why I don't think I'm going to do or have to say or have the courage to say the right thing. And that might be the others people. I might be trying to be beholden to them or it could be the individual fears that I have or it could be societal fears. All these things hold me back from the, the fear of amputating the thing I know that I know to do right to be on the other side of that equation doesn't have to do with politics, it doesn't have to do with race, it has to do with every single thing that we make decisions about. And that's why I think these, these sessions liberate people because it has myself first looking inward and not looking to everybody else to dictate what my fears are going to be, what my fears are. And I'm very thankful for that because it gets me to that rebirth side and whatever I'm dealing with faster. It makes me move quicker. So it's like an athlete who takes feedback from the coach. And if the athlete can't take feedback from the coach, there's two things that are going on. Either the athlete's wrong or the coach is wrong. One, one or two. If they can't work together, then a new coach has to be found. But if they can work together, they know that the coach only has their best interest at heart. And so if we can just get through that, whatever the mistake is or the correction to the mistake is, we can get through it faster, that athlete wins quicker. Bonnie St. John's, who was on our program a few weeks ago, and she said in her story, as a downhill skier, first African-American woman to win a medal in downhill skiing, she won a bronze. Um, everybody fell at one spot, all of them. And she was leading in the first one of the, the giant slalom. So she was leading and so uh, and the, after the first run. So all she had to do was to stay upright. She was going to win because everybody else was falling. So she goes down, makes through all, the whole thing, and then falls at – right before the, the finish line she gets up and she, she finished the race and she wins bronze why because the person or so i can work but the person that was behind her in the first run passed her only because she got up faster that's what this is all about it's how fast can you get up after you've, you've taken a fall how, how fast can you actually get to truth rather than manipulating facts to try to make it in your favor so those are the things I think are really the, the challenges that we have, but I'm thankful for them because if we choose to redefine our moments faster and amputate what's holding us back, then we can live on that rebirth side and that equals our liberation. Our liberation opens up the cage for us to fly and, and be great in that echolocation with all this positive stuff going to start flowing our way, but it's not for us. It's for us to leave legacy, to help somebody else in their path so they can have the courage to overcome. So the last thing I want to share with you is this. And then I put in the chat box whether you agree, disagree. I love the, the comments and things that's still on. Um, the, the last thing I want to share with you, my time. Uh, the last thing I want to share with you is this. Uh, on, the, uh, on, the, on the courage side of this equation, where once I'm leaving legacy for somebody, I can't do it for them. I want you to hear that. I, I can't do it for them. 
because the jump is the jump. And this is one of the most profound things that I learned, not just about a year and a half ago. People are always looking for some type of a book or the five widgets for being more, living more courageously, be more courageous. And other people can't do it for you. This is one, one area of life where it's on you. You have to do it. And that's a scary place for people. Because like I said before, if I have the courage, I'm good. If I don't, I gotta justify why I didn't have the courage to do, do something. But no one can give it to you. I was on a ropes course as an amputee in Ohio. And I'm roped in, I'm, I'm strapped in, I'm 50 feet off the ground. Uh, and I, I'm, doing, I'm going jumping across these discs, right? And, and so I, you have to hold on to the next rope and pull yourself to the next disc. But one rope and disc is, is too far. So I like this this far apart. So it's easy to jump, right? Boom, boom. But one is like this, and I can't make the. I just know I can't make that jump. So do I go back or how do I make this? I'm harnessed in, so I know if I miss it, I'm going to fall. But at least I can dangle, <laughs> uh, and I'll I'll be I'll be okay. But my brain is not, quote unquote, registering it like that. And all these kids are flying by me. Come on, Mr. Register, let's go, let's go. You can do it, you can do it. And that bing, 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 bing. And they're making their jumps and stuff. All these kids with amputee, amputations. I'm like, ah, uh, I, don't, I, can't, I can't make the jump. None of them, with their, all their encouraging words from the ground yelling up or passing me by, could get me to make the jump. If somebody pushed me from the back, Maybe I make the jump, but it's not me doing it. It's somebody pushing me to do it, right? We don't want to push people to do it. We want people to have their own success. So I finally, eventually, after about 20 minutes, probably longer than that, got the courage to make the jump, and it wasn't as bad as I thought. I make the jump, and I make the rest of the course. I get down. I'm not doing it again. <laughs> um, but that's just it. We have to have the courage to make the jump, and the jump has to be our own decision to make that jump. And if I choose to do it, I'm living great because I can now re, I can now build on a, a new foundation. If I don't have the courage, I'm on an old foundation. I'm trying to erect old principles, old thoughts, old ideas. And because I'm erecting all these old things, my my building is going to topple. It's it's about to fall over because I know on the the premise of the whole foundation is wrong because I didn't have the courage to jump. I'm now justifying why I didn't make the leap. That's a hard thing to to talk about. When we get into it, we have to dig down deep. And I, and I believe that once we do, once we have these conversations, once we have this, this, this internal conversation with ourselves and then with our teams and others, our organizations move, move faster and they get done, they, they, they expand faster. We, we're more resilient in the process. So that's what I got for you all today. Thank you so much for tuning in. I really appreciate all y'all being in. If you have any thoughts or comments, I'll stay on for just a couple seconds just to see what you have. Uh, I'm going to kind of wrap wrap the whole thing up right now. I do have some things I just want to share with you real fast that are coming up. Um, one is that we have this. Um, on December 3rd, I'm going to just embrace your new normal uh, mindset live on December 3rd. There's a registration link. I'm not going to put it in there. So if you want it, my um, go to, where's what I, what I have everybody going to? Um, I'll just, just do my, my email. I'm just, just john at johnregister.com. You want it? I'll just send it to you there. Um, so I think it's up and ready, and I'll send you. I'll send you a link for it. It's pretty easy. It's, it's really for meeting professionals. We're trying to put somebody in that's going to inspire, impact, uh, engage their teams for next year, and try to help them out with that. The second thing is, I want you to remember that I'm, I'm not going to do this. To, I, I may do the program. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm, but I'm going to take a break, social media break, from December 7th, 13th. Uh, I'm just going to just get out of town. I'm going to go riding a little bit. And so that's going to be the thing that's that's coming up. Um, the third thing is I want you to remember what echoes have corrected your course. What echoes have corrected your course? Fifth thing, remember you are the inspiration. And uh, that's what you all to, to know that. Okay, so that is it for uh, this session of Hermos University, Inspires and Maximizes the Pivotal Moments. You are the inspiration because inspiration is the catalyst to motivation. Motivation in turn causes actions. Actions lead us to transformational results. 
and these results they re-inspire us or they allow somebody else that's watching the process to catch the vision have a great wonderful thanksgiving enjoy your families and i will chat with you uh next thursday god bless and have a, a great day go forth inspire your world bye for now